have one other person for this presentation connecting to the uh, telecon. Chris, if you can hear me, the telecon will be our best bet then if, uh, if we have to use one or the other. So go ahead and dial into that with the leader code I sent you. Um, yeah, we'll be good to go. Yeah, this is Chris. I'm. Okay. What's the line of it? Okay, how, how does that sound? Uh, we can hear you here in the room. Everybody hear you? I'm, I really can't hear you because I'm. I'm trying to talk on the phone and the, and the mic, and that's not working. Your your audio just went away, Chris. If you could um, just use your telephone and mute the speakers okay. on your okay. computer, that'll that'll work better. You want me to just use the phone then? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Let me disable my mic here. All right. All right. Everything you started, Rick? Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Lasinski, and I'm located down at Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. And I'm Rick Hess, and I'm located down here in Fairmont. I'd like to thank everybody for attending this presentation uh, with regards to the James Webb Space Telescope Integrated Science Management Module Independent Testing Campaign. From here on out, we're just going to refer to it as uh, JWST and ISIM. Uh, the presentation is going to focus on uh, our efforts in identifying test cases for the JWST ISIM test campaign. So we'll display the agenda, Rick. Okay, we're going to give everybody a brief overview of JWST for people who are not familiar with it and ISIM. Uh, we're going to talk about the independent test environment the GIST test bed, we're going to discuss some of the uh, test products that we've developed to date and which are coming up in the future. We're going to discuss our test case identification approaches, which involve stress testing, some tests like U4 five processes, and technical issue memorandum or TIM mic, in addition to a supplemental method which is going to uh, help us do some extra uh, rigor in, in our testing efforts with the above methods. Uh, then we'll provide a brief summary of our efforts to date, what's coming up uh, for future work, and then we'll open up the uh, floor to questions. Okay, okay JWST, for those of you who don't know, is a very large infrared optimized space telescope. Uh, it's been delayed a couple of times, but right now it's on scheduled to launch in, I believe it's October of 2018. Uh, JWST has three segments, the launch, observatory, and ground. We're going to be con uh, concerned with the observatory, which uh, consists of the Integrated Science Instrument Module, ISOM, and uh, four science instruments, in addition to the OTE, which is the optical uh, telescope element, and the spacecraft. But we won't be discussing those today. That's just for informational purposes. Okay, the ISOM uh, is, consists of nine support systems, which we're not going to list here. Uh, a near-infrared camera, a near-infrared spectrograph, a uh, mid-infrared instrument, and a five-guidance sensor with a uh, nearest. And there is a URL for those of you that are interested in going out and finding out a little bit more about JWST. You can go to that link. Okay. Okay. You can see here JWST resides in the L2 orbit of the Sun Earth system. Uh, L2 is approximately 932,000 miles from Earth on its night side, and it'll stay in a halo orbit in a constant location due to the gravity of, of the Earth and the Sun and uh, station keeping maneuvers of the, uh, the observatory. Okay, the ISOM flight software. Uh, it's primarily responsible for executing science scripts, uh, for performing science activities on the observatory. Uh, I believe they are all up in JavaScript. Is that right, Rick? Uh, um, yes. I think that's what it is. It's, it's the uh, OSS, the script, script subsystem. Not to put you on the spot there. Uh, that's fine. Uh, it's also responsible for routing all commands and telemetry, both to and from uh, the science instrument. Uh, specific flight software, which is also part of or executed on the ISIM processor. Uh, 
responsible, responsible for communicating with the command and telemetry processor uh, of the spacecraft by a 1553 bus. It processes all the image data and transfers it to the solid state recorder, uh, which is on board the spacecraft and later downlinked uh, to ground via the deep space network. And lastly, one of its primary uh, responsibilities is monitoring the health of science instrument play software and hardware. Okay, this picture here shows some of the, uh, the key elements of JWST. The ISOM is situated in the back behind that primary mirror. It's a uh, segmented mirror. It's made up of 18 segments. Each segment uh, weighs approximately 46 pounds. Uh, the, the mirror itself, all the optics on, on board JWST are made out of beryllium, and they have a thin layer of gold uh, coating them for reflectivity. And the diameter of that mirror is approximately, I think it's 21 feet, 4 inches. Next slide. This is uh, the ice layout. We're not going to get involved in any of the, uh, the details here. This is just to give you an idea of where it's located uh, on board the, the observatory. All right, and uh, the next slide here talks about, we're going to start talking about the GIST test bed itself. Uh, GIST means JWST IVMP Simulation Test Bed. It's actually created by our ITC group here. It's a successor to SIDU. It's actually used assist scripts, which we use Eclipse scripts on GIST. And it can only test um, pieces of ISOM. It cannot do spacecraft. GIST includes functionality for the following components, uh, CPP domain and data handling, the integration of ISOM, and the Northrop Grumman Dynamics Simulator, uh, the Software Development Verification, or SDV. As you can see in this image right here, we've got, I just basically wanted to show this real quick, we've got three virtual machines, um, and they connect to a virtual box host only network that we have here called the Cloud. And we can be able to remote into that uh, to be able to work on it remotely, or we can go down in the lab and look for the machine itself. All right, so the next slide here, um, test bed validation. So how exactly do we make sure the test bed is working as it should? Well, we need to validate it. Uh, so exactly how do we do that? Well, we run the SIDU test scripts that were originally ran on the SIDU test bed, and also we run any of the scripts that we have, or combination of the scripts that we have from IC1 to IC14. Um, if there's differences that we find, we should be able to understand and explain those. And if we don't validate the test bed, then our results and cells may be inaccurate. So when it comes to just test products, these are the things that we should be able to generate as a part of this uh, effort. And the first one is Essentially, it's maintaining confluence, which is a working tool that we use here at IVMV. Um, it describes the scope, approach, resources, test items, testing tasks, processes, and the schedule of the intended testing activity. Uh, the test cases, which are actually maintained in JIRA, which is a task management system that we use here at IVMV, um, provides rationales, objectives, initial conditions, inputs, outputs, and methods. Uh, we also uh, have as a product test procedures, which detail a series of steps taken by the test analyst. Also maintained in SVN, which is Subversion, uh, which is a change control system that we use here. And then finally, test scripts, the scripts themselves. Uh, they're executed in the GIST environment. We also, again, uh, keep those in SVN. Okay, that brings us to which uh, to us is very important. Before we wanted to jump in there and start doing any kind of testing, we need to figure out what it is we were going to test and why we were going to test it. Uh, to date, we've developed a test plan which uh, identifies our four processes that we, we created for test case identification. That involves stress, stress testing, just like you fly, TIM mining, also known as uh, neighborhood analysis. And source code metrics, as I mentioned before, that's going to be a supplemental method. First method is stress, stress testing. And stress testing utilizes ISO source code in addition to our level 5 performance requirements. Uh, for 
normal climate environment that we're talking about are not necessarily the ag development requirement specification and performance requirements because I believe we actually only had three or four of what we did uh, later on in our process is went through and analyzed each requirement uh, to determine if it actually had any performance uh, characteristics. Uh, the purpose of stress testing is to identify uh, some different errors than what you normally get with uh, your unit testing or your functional uh, testing. You want to see, you know, does the system recover or, uh, from a stressor once you put on it? And you also want to see how the system uh, behaves whenever you stress it. Uh, and if it does crash or does fail, then we need to determine the root cause of, of the failure. On to the testing process. We obtained the item level five uh, requirements from a retro dump from the developer. We filtered manually all of the requirements uh, and assessed them to see if they had any quantitative performance values that we could uh, possibly test. Then we took a look at each one of these candidates that we identified and we looked at them from the uh, standpoint of can we benefit, can we drive any better additional benefit from testing this requirement? How feasible is it to test and also can we do it with the gist? And finally, we selected our final uh, level five requirements for stress testing. And this is a, an image um, from one of our engineering that the requirement description is blurred out due to ITAR consideration. But you can see the uh, level five requirement tag there in the first column. Also what, uh, I believe it's DSC that it's from, uh, when it was implemented, when it was tested, and, and whether it passed or failed, or whatever the disposition was. Next slide, Rick. Okay, the next step in the process would be identifying the test case that we have not well, we identified the test cases, but we haven't developed them yet. That's something that's going to be uh, for future work. That's something that we need we need to uh, focus on. Go ahead, next, next slide. All right, this is uh, a snippet from some of our results. Uh, health and safety, spacecraft interface support. You'll notice there's a number, an ISM CSC ID, uh, the computer, or the, you know, the computers software component ID that we assign to uh, each one of the CSCs. It's got nothing to do with uh, numbers assigned by the developers, but this one particular test case that we, that we uh, came up with was software subsystem monitoring, and it was given the ID 001.3, and you see it exercised that there's five different requirements. So what exactly we're going to do in that test case, that still re remains to be developed simply because we haven't uh, received the gist with the ISM capability yet. And you can see uh, further on down, we have the spacecraft interface support, keep alive response that we're going to test. And we're also going to test uh, ICMDH telemetry inside of the um, ISM CSC spacecraft interface support. Next slide. Total, we identified 19 test cases out of 67 uh, performance requirements that we deemed testable. Uh, there were some additional uh, performance requirements that we didn't collect. Okay, the next method we identified for coming up with test cases was a test like you fly approach. Uh, normally, test like you fly is done with the very end of a, uh, a software project by the developers, and it involves flight articles, the flight hardware, and that's something that we don't have, but we do have just test bed. Now, what differentiates DOYF for end-to-end -end testing from your normal testing? It tends to be mission-centric uh, as opposed to requirement-centric, which is verification-based. Mission-centric testing is more validation-based. Uh, some, some of the flaws that we hope to uh, identify are timing issues, memory leaks, data errors. Uh, again, stress that it's not directed at requirements verification. And more importantly, it demonstrates uh, that all the components of the ISOM work correctly together rather than demonstrating uh, individual components and their functionality. Now, what we're going to try to do is perform uh, 
numerous tasks concurrently, you know, day in a life test, long duration test, uh, basically exercise the ISOM as close to what it's actually going to experience on orbit. Now, I'm not really sure if we're going to be able to actually stress it that hard, but we may be able to push some of the some of the CSVs and see if we can generate some, some anomalies, some bugs. Uh, the test cases were derived from the mission CONOPS document, in addition to the observatory end-to-end VNB test plan, which was something that our IVNB team a few years ago had our hands in uh, beginning the development of. Go to the next slide. Okay, we started out the process by creating a spreadsheet which contained uh, normal and contingency operational scenarios, which we got out of uh, both the CONOPS document and the end to end verification and validation plan. The two pretty much mirrored each other uh, pretty well in that respect. A few years ago, our IVNB team was tasked with coming up with some of the key functionality uh, of the ISOM based on ISOM requirements. And you can see down below in bullet three, uh, we, we determined that uh, the major functionality or the key functionality uh, areas were processing the commands, ISOM telemetry, uh, management of files, et cetera. And the project actually took a lot of our work and started developing an IVMD test plan. The next step in the process was to identify uh, key CONOPS requirements. You'll see on the next slide that uh, involve uh, the ISOM. Not all CONOPS requirements involve the ISOM. Some, re some involve the ground and the spacecraft. Some involve all three in the science instrument. But we're, we're, we're primarily focused on the ISOM. What we did, we took a look at these candidate scenarios from the basis of feasibility and testability using the GIST, and then figured out, well, what kind of flaws can we possibly generate here? And we finalized our list of Test like you fly scenarios from those candidates. All right. Here's an example. Unfortunately, we had to blur out most of the requirements from the CONOPS document. But these are the these are the key or a, a, a sample of some of the key requirements from the CONOPS document. Next slide, Rick. Now, these uh, items highlighted in yellow are. Test cases that I, I believe we can probably get get the earliest start on. They're going to be some of them. I wouldn't say easy, but they're going to be uh, some of the easier ones to implement. Um, but test like you fly is probably going to be down the list of um, tests that we're going to execute. We're going to execute the stress test first, I believe, and we're going to follow that up probably with uh, some of the uh, the TIM mining test cases, and Rick is going to speak to that in a couple of minutes. Next slide. We developed 17 total uh, test like you fly test cases from the CONOPS and the end-to-end -end test plan. That's quite a significant amount of, of test cases, but uh, we'd rather be in a situation where we have more to test than what we're capable of than having not enough. And I believe that brings us to the TIM mining overview. Yep, thanks, Chris. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about with the TIM mining overview is literally it's reviewing JWS results. Uh, TIM mining overview or TIM mining method itself actually allows us to do three different things. It allows us to determine sections of the flight software that could potentially contain problematic or error prone code. It allows us to provide assurance for the impact and severity of existing errors. And it also allows us to provide validation. In addition, we've looked at TIMs from four different phases of the life cycle, requirements, design, testing, and code. They were analyzed manually based upon the criteria. And uh, let me go ahead and move to uh, code TIM, for example. So this slide here, um, we're going to show a process of how we looked at the code TIMs. First, we started with an orbit query that a domain was ISIM, the defect defect category was code and meets certain state criteria. Export the results of that query to an Excel sheet uh, and then we check to see if the state is PAR. If it is, it's a candidate. Otherwise, the TIMS is reviewed to see whether or not a modification of the source code was needed. 
If so, that's added as a candidate as well. Then we manually evaluate each TIM, looking at the different things such as red spawn and impact and testing feasibility. And then we select the final TIMS for testing. Here's an image. Um, note that the uh, TIM data and the source files here are actually listed. And the highlighted items obviously mean that they were selected as candidates. So then as part of the TIM mining process, we identified test cases based upon the selected TIMs, like I said before and we develop test cases using them. Now on slide 29, we're actually looking at different CSCs. If you notice the black lines here, um, those represent the differences between the different CSCs. And the CSCs, again, have been given IDs. Um, you'll also notice that some of this you can't really tell, but some of the areas we got here as an example is file management, health and safety, and memory load and dump. As part of our TIM mining, oh, we found that uh, there was 29 different test cases utilizing, um, or formulated from the di four different phases of the life cycle. And what's funny about the numbers down at the bottom is, it was exactly 75% of these results were the code and requirement TIMs, which is basically 154 and 124 put together. So that means that only 25% were really designed TIMs and test now let's talk about source code methods. Uh, they're used to determine complex areas in code. You, we used understand to generate those metrics. Um, specific metrics were selected and there were around 70 possible. Um, and we use this again as a supplement to other methods. Um, also if the area is deemed complex and we already have a test case out for that specific area, then we may actually be able to use this to warrant the creation of more test cases in that area. So this is the process that we used. First of all, we generated the results using understand. Then we selected the metrics that we wanted. So you'll notice that there's such an amount of complexity, some such an amount of complexity, count of coupled classes, maximum nesting level of controlled contracts, maximum systematic complexity, path count, and nonce. Um, I'll point out path count because we'll look at that a lot later, um, which is the number of unique paths through a body of code. Then, um, as we continue down this process, um, we sort the uh, objects by the selected metric. We look at the distribution of the object. We select a cutoff point and create a list of target areas based upon that. And then we assign a final threshold value for those target areas. All right, so um, again, here's another slide in which we have uh, the metrics themselves. Uh, you can't really tell it really well, but there's um, functions here is what we're showing. And um, they also show here this path count. And uh, it's this bottom value here, again, you can't see it very well. It's 4,194,304 different ways to go through code. Pretty high. So um, this right here, this as part of the process, we uh, check to see if it's a class. If it's a class, and either the count of coupled classes and the maximum systematic complexity is greater than a threshold, we add it to the final list. If it's a functional method, and two out of the three metrics listed here are uh, above their thresholds, then we add it to the final list. And again, the metrics are used as a supplement to provide additional rigor to the test case. Okay, so uh, this is an example of the source code metrics results. You'll notice that it's broken up by type. It shows type, file, uh, and the name of the object. Um, not all objects use all the metrics. You'll notice that some of these are actually empty based upon their type. And then the last thing here is this value down here is 999,999,999. So that's at that point it says, we're done, we're not going to go any further, and we're going to move on to the next one. Finally, uh, we identified 22 target areas as being complex and potentially error-prone, and um, 
I, I do want to stress again that this is actually used as a suffix. Back to you. Okay, in summary, uh, we were able to assign or associate uh, computer software components, the TSDs, with all the identified test cases from our stress testing and a TIM mining uh, test cases. Now, test like you fly, obviously, is not a TSD, but in order to maintain our numbering scheme, we ended up assigning uh, three different um, TSD numbers to it. One for event-driven ops, as you'll see later, one for real-time operations, and one for long-duration normal operations. So a summary of the uh, test cases is on the next slide. And here we have every ISOM CSC is represented here. Uh, there are a total of 14, and we identified at least one test case uh, for each of the CSCs. That's not something that we planned. That's just how it ended up coming out, which was which was good because we didn't go in with any kind of preconceived you know scheme to come up with with that. Uh, we have a total number of test cases identified at 63, which is pretty significant. Uh, that's something that we're going to probably answer now. It also depends on you know, if we're going to have enough time to go and exercise all of these particular test cases. Uh, this, this effort is probably going to go on for a couple of years. And if it does, then obviously more is, more is better than uh, less. Next slide. Okay, this will be called the C button. It is the first slide of two, which shows each of the CSDs uh, over on the left hand side with the number and, and the name. And also in the right hand side, you have the test case ID followed by the test case title. So, for instance, for health and safety, we've identified eight test cases. Uh, from CPU utilization all the way down through configuration table validation. Uh, the next slide, I believe, shows the remaining uh, CSCs, including the test like you fly uh, areas, event driven ops, time ops, and long duration normal ops. Next slide, Rick. So, what are we going to do in the future? Uh, first thing we're probably going to do is prioritize the test cases. You know, what do we want to do first? And uh, I believe we're, we're going to try to get as much done as we can with the stress testing and also the uh, in mining test cases. And then we're going to focus on tests like you fly. And, and it's obvious why we're going to do that is because that's the most difficult part. So you want to start small and build your way up. Um, after we develop or identify the test cases, we're going to actually start test case development followed by test procedure and test script uh, development as we go. We're anticipating from the IPC team a delivery of just build 2.0 sometime in the fourth quarter of this year, and just 2.0 is going to contain the ISOM functionality that we need to perform our testing. The execution of the test procedures and test scripts that we develop are going to take place next year, fiscal year 2014, beginning in October. Uh, next year, we hope to take some of the results that we get and present them either in a uh, you know, workshop like this or in an IVBO technical discussion. Perhaps a tech discussion would be better because you get a little bit longer time period than what you do here. Uh, we've also began development of a spacecraft test plan and identification of test cases uh, for spacecraft work. And we've also uh, started some risk reduction test case scenario generation. Uh, Joe Wu, who is a uh, former Northrop Grumman uh, employee, he's He's been a great help getting us started in uh, that area. So after uh, after saying that, um, we're open to questions. I don't know if we have to move to another telecon, Rick. We're going to stay in this room for questions since this is the final presentation of the day. If you'll hit your microphone.
Right. Uh, yeah. Um, as far as, did you hear that, Chris? No, I didn't hear the question, Rick. Okay, he's just asking about themselves. Okay. Um, so, uh, as far as metrics go, uh, we we had a ton of different. We had about seventy. Different so we wanted to take. So it really wasn't. I mean, there's other questions. Uh, question: Whether or not themselves is the school good enough to provide them something that's actually considered valuable. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't using it as its own metric, but supplement our data. So, and and so we didn't look at like, uh, things like number of lines of code and that kind of stuff because essentially what we were trying to do is just see and and well let's put it like this it wasn't only file based it was also uh, they looked for class they looked for function and uh, it was also like a structure to the class. so what it did is it split up all the data. So a lot of times um, you may think that uh, you would see a file and then you would actually see a class within that file. So it was very hard to separate those out. And uh, we we actually just went ahead and just uh, just took the specific areas that were most complex as far as these six or, or seven metrics go. But we really didn't compare them to you know how many lines of code. Uh, how big the file size was. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. No, no, that's a, that's a good point. Um, gotcha. So, uh, Chris, just to let you know what she was saying, um, there was a, um, I, I guess you could say that there was a lot. Do we actually look at the change itself? And so, uh, meaning the change impact from the previous bill to see how much has changed in relation to that. So meaning that we did we take a look at the number of lines of code, how what different things have changed as part of the last build, part of a potential uh, you know risk or anything like that. No, we didn't we didn't do anything like that. No. We just looked at the uh, the overall distribution. It was it was purely uh, a relative uh, analysis. We you know when we say something's complex, we're, we didn't go in with any type of preconceived notion about. Uh, what a particular metric value should be, um, you know, for example, the uh, count of coupled classes, for instance, or the, the maximum nesting level. We, we, we wanted to augment or you know, supplement our testing in some way using metrics, and we said, well, what's a manageable, you know, set of uh, areas, you know, uh, classes, you know, functions and methods, and we started playing with the distribution and some of the numbers and the key metrics. And, you know, we, we kept coming up with these huge numbers, like 500 to 1,000 uh, areas. And I said, that's, that's not doable. We need to get it under 100. So we started uh, playing with those metrics, and that's how we came up with some of the thresholds and, and the final list of target areas. But what I will say is what you have said is interesting to us because that's something that we may look at in the future is the changes actually uh, – as per the bills. If you take a look at that, maybe we could go back and say, well, you know, this stuff has changed. Um, maybe we need to take a closer look at that. Um, yeah. Okay. 
Right. And we actually have to do that. Well, we do that as part of another analysis to do these change impacts on the whole. So we do check that we see where changes have occurred. So, I mean, that's not out of the box. It's actually a good point. Um, we do need to think in the future, too, about uh, trying to take a look at that. Now, I will say also, this is our first time doing the ice and fist. Now, next time, um, I, I definitely want to do that, especially because of the fact that we now we'll have a test bed up front. So once we get a new build and we try to implement it into Jess, now we can actually, you know, especially look at those changes. Maybe we can uh, throw that in as another exactly how we would implement it. Well, but right now, you're right because uh, first, once we get the test bed validated, so we can say now this is okay. Now we get a new bill, and then we say what's changed? What do we have to revalidate? We can find the pieces that have changed, and the pieces that haven't changed, we don't necessarily need to validate it to know that they're you know, complete and they work okay. I actually like that. Uh, good point. Um, any other questions? Well, that, that's why I say, um, it, it depends. That's why I say if the module itself is you know, somewhat of a uh, standalone, because we have, uh, what is it, nine different instruments? So on the... No, there's four, four different instruments. Four instruments, I forget the other nine, but, but uh, the four different instruments actually have to con uh, work together. We have different developers. And so that's what's... Some of these pieces do um, No, I mean, granted, they work with ISIM and, and all that. So, in, in your case, yes, you're you're right. I mean, you would have to really know that this stuff has going to impact other areas. However, since we've got all these pieces that have to stand alone themselves, it, it's not impossible to think that you know, you'd be okay. Um, granted, uh, you still want to test that to make sure everything's going to be okay. And that's why we're doing test that to fly test, just to make sure that everything runs. And then in the future, they'll we'll do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So, any other questions? All right, I think that's, well, did we have any? Um, okay, all right. Well, uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, thanks, Chris, appreciate it. And uh, look forward to hopefully presenting something next year. Let's hope so. Thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, just to let everybody in the room know, we hovered right around 100 attendees online today. So while this room seems a little empty, we uh, have had a lot of participation online, at least with watching, and I believe some of the breakout sessions had some interaction as well. So we look forward to you coming back again tomorrow. We start at 8.15. Tomorrow we actually have a separate breakout session. Hang on just a second. Um, Right around the lunch hour, if you want to plan to take an abbreviated lunch, you might bring your lunch with you so that you can, uh, or, you know, have your lunch ready to go. Right at 12.15, in our breakout room, we'll have a separate session. The topic is static analysis, code quality characteristics. It'll be a discussion in there. It will also be online in the, discuss in the breakout room um, discussion. So that's a supplemental breakout session scheduled. Um, one other thing, tomorrow if you are here on site and you need a breakout room or a, a meeting room, we do have some room available. Um, that can be scheduled with um, our young lady that was here this morning at the front table at first thing in the morning or throughout the day. And then if anybody has any questions between now and tomorrow, you can email me. I can't guarantee I'll get it, but I'm also here first thing in the morning right around 7 o'clock. So thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow.